just do one single case study and ask what would evidential pluralism look like for one case study. Um, so this is based partially on a, a paper which is coming out in the book Philosophy in the Age of Science, um, but it's very much a work in progress, so I am uh, very happy to hear your feedback on it. Um, evidential pluralism, as I will understand it today, simply means that there is no single right causal evidential theory for political science. We'll have counterexamples. We know that there are areas where correlations work better than um, mechanistic evidence. We know that there are areas where interventions work better, for instance, than uh, a systems analysis in terms of entities and activities. So evidential pluralism might be a natural reaction. We might say there are many different uh, things that we could give evidence for, many different views of causation we could get evidence for, correlations, interventions, entities and activities, they can all strengthen the causal hypothesis. That would be your evidential pluralism. Um, I want to flag just briefly, because I don't think we've been uh, flagging that before, is that this does not mean that we need different kinds of evidence all the time for these different views. Um, Imagine, say, memoirs of participants in a particular conflict or witness accounts, um, declassified archival sources about presidential decision making. All of these could be evidence for different sorts of things or different sorts of views. And so that's important to keep in mind here. So I'll try to make that distinction here in the uh, language I use as well. Um, now, as we've just noticed. Um, I don't think political science is alone in usually talking about pluralism in regards to say quantitative versus qualitative evidence or statistical versus mechanistic. Um, and in this case I won't be uh, trying to argue that both of these approaches are necessary. Instead I'll just focus on how pluralism would work in single case study research. And what I will argue, as uh, we've flagged just now in the Q&A, is that there are different views of causation and associated methodologies. And each of these different methodologies, despite this, despite the um, simple arguments for evidential pluralism, it might lead to inconsistent advice for researchers. And what I'll do is I'll give an, a clear example of a case where there is conflicting advice. And so this leads me to the conclusion that a blanket acceptance of methodologies in case study research is ill-advised. What this boils down to is that evidence of one sort of thing, for instance, actual causation in terms of entities and activities, might conflict with a search for evidence of another type of thing in the sense of, say, hypothetical intervention outcomes. So these two searches are not compatible with one another, on a very pragmatic level, at the very least. All right. Now, what do we do when such advice conflicts? I'll try to argue for the claim that we must then consider the aim of the study to establish which evident, evidential search fits best. And I'll give a concrete example of a case where I think you can see the aims directly influence the methodology that's most suitable. So. Uh, where then is pluralism? Is there still room for pluralism in this view? Yes, but only on the level of uh, different case studies potentially being compatible with different types of methodologies. So it's not the case that only one methodology in political science in case study research is preferable. It's the case that for every single case study we must consider which of the methodologies is most suited to the aims. All right, so I'll highlight this argument in the following steps. I'll talk very briefly about process tracing. Um, I get the feeling that uh, quite a few of the participants in the workshop are familiar with it, but for those of you who aren't, I'll focus on that for a little bit. Then I'll try to um, highlight the kind of evidence or the evidence of the types um, of views that is necessary, so what kind of evidential searches uh, do different methodologies imply? And I'll draw from that a tension um, as related to evidential pluralism. So what tension is there between these two different methodologies that I'll highlight? And finally, I'll talk about my argument for pluralism case by case, which is the title of this talk. 
All right. So uh, what will I consider process tracing to be? And of course, we'll talk about that later in uh, several more talks today. Process tracers, in the most simple view, try to find the causal mechanism that links a putative cause and effective interest in a case study. And to do so, they try to identify and verify the observable implication of such a mechanism. So as a very simple example, uh, Nina Tannenwald, in her 1999 paper, postulates that a nuclear taboo was a key mechanism behind non-use of, uh, of nuclear weapons in the United States during several conflicts, including the Korean War, but also the Persian Gulf War, the Vietnam War. And what does she do? She tries to trace the um, observable implications of that taboo. So if this taboo is one of the uh, reasons for non-use, then what would we expect to see in, say, archival sources? What would we expect to hear in witness reports, etc.? Now, the uh, other side to process tracing that's essential here is the insistence on also considering alternative hypotheses. So what are the observable implications of the alternative mechanisms that uh, Tannenwald considers? These are related to deterrence. So she considers if deterrence would be the um, only or the main explanation behind non-use, what would we have expected to see, say, in the analysis of um, President Truman and President Eisenhower? What would we have expected to see there? Right, so like I said, you can trace these mechanisms by looking at observable implications like the following. And um, during the Korean War, she argues that the nuclear taboo manifested itself in moral concerns that uh, Truman and his advisors had. And then when Eisenhower came to power, it was not against using uh, nuclear. He did not have those qualms about using nuclear weapons himself, according to Tannenwald. Uh, but it was the adverse public and world opinion um, that the taboo uh, was constituted by, and so those constrained the uh, use of nuclear weapons, leading to non-use. And her argument is that deterrence cannot explain these events completely, and I point you to the paper uh, involved. I'll have some references at the end if you want to read more about this. So now that we've seen an example, we've seen uh, a very clear method and uh, using that word um, specifically, not methodology, but a very particular method which talks about causal mechanisms. And here the causal mechanisms are more metaphorical than you would find them in biomedical uh, research or in um, biology. So for instance, you don't have your physical cogs and wheels, you don't have your proteins, your synapses, your uh, natrium ions, etc. And the question then is, and I think this is where evidential pluralist discussions come into play, for what kinds of things exactly should we collect evidence in the process tracing method? If we wish to do process tracing properly, what do we need to find evidence for? Now, as was already briefly mentioned, this depends on your notion of causation and mechanism as a concept hides a large variety of different notions of causation. And you can find this for, from Jim Mahoney's uh, 2001 paper, but it's all over the literature. So the question is, what exactly constitutes a causal me mechanism in process tracing? This leads to different methodologies. Um, and these different methodologies all point to a different kind of evidential search. Now, to make this very concrete, in a 2016 uh, newsletter from the Qualitative and Multi-Method Research uh, section of um, the American Political Science Association, you have this debate in which I was involved, Derek, who's also in this conference, was involved, about these different understandings of mechanisms and how they could inform divergent arguments about how process tracing should proceed. Now, if we accept a strong evidential pluralism, we might say that although these methodologists all have different evidential searches in mind, so even though they do not agree on what kinds of things we should collect evidence for, we could just take the advice of each of them. 
jointly use all of these types of evidential search, these pieces of evidence to inform our belief in the purported causal mechanism. Just like uh, in the Russell-Williamson thesis, you would say, let's use these correlations and these causal mechanisms. But this, like I said, this is a limited to a case study research method alone. And even there, you see that evidential pluralism would tell you to take several different methodologies at once. So, in Thunderbolt's case, what should she have collected evidence for? Should she collect evidence for probability raising or for counterfactuals or for some kind of actual causation in entities and activities? Or perhaps all of them. And all of them, that would be the strongest evidential pluralist view here. Now, unfortunately, uh, my argument is that different theories of evidence in process tracing, different methodologies, will lead to mutually contradictory advice. And that is bad news for the pluralist, from a pragmatic standpoint, at the very least. Here are two views. Uh, so Derek and I had a brief email conversation about this before the conference as well. And in that newsletter, you can find a very clear difference between our two methodologies. So he proposes a systems view of causal mechanisms. You see mechanisms as a set of entities engaging in activities. Causal force is transmitted from one entity to another. And I interpret this as a thick observation of causation. So an attempt to seek thick observations of causation. You do not only see two contiguous events, but you also try to directly observe that there's a relation between them. How do you do this in terms of the causal force, in terms of these entities and activities? And so, it's no wonder that uh, Derek emphasizes you should be more concerned with what actually took place in the empirical record. Okay, so this is one particular methodology. And the alternative methodology which I prescribed to and which I highlight in that paper is um, an interventionist view. So there we see a mechanism as either a chain or perhaps even a network of intervening variables. In, of course, in the most complicated cases, can be a very uh, um, complicated uh, network with many different intervening variables all interacting with each other. But in the simplest case, you are looking at a chain of events and wish to know that each of these steps in the chain of events are causally related. How do you do that? You do that in terms of interventions as per uh, Jim Woodward's view. So for each of the steps in this causal chain or for each of the links in this causal network, you would need to find evidence of a, probably a hypothetical intervention. And this can get quite technical and I refer you to the, my 2014 paper in philosophy of science for more details on that. So the interventionist view here claims that you can only make thin observations. It is not the case that you can merely observe two contiguous events and say on the basis of that that there is a causal relation between them. And I'm quite skeptical in that paper about the possibility of doing anything but a thin observation. Any kind of observation I argue there needs to be supplemented with evidence um, of a hypothetical intervention. And this could, for instance, take the form of a comparative analysis. So looking to other case studies where perhaps a similar event has occurred um, or a similar circumstance um, has obtained. And again, here you can clearly see that these are two very different views. And I would argue strongly that um, these are not compatible, at least not on a pragmatic level, perhaps even on a, a more fundamental level. An interventionist view of mechanisms would claim that one cannot observe causation in a single case, and a systems view of mechanisms would claim that single case observations are a trustworthy source of evidence for causation. And this directly speaks against one another. Um, so, for instance, when uh, Derek advises that there is no objective empirical truth conditions for assessing a non-existent but possible alternative world, this is directly uh, contradictory to my counterfactual approach. And in an interventionist view, if really we do not gain information about how the process actually played out in one single case, like he says, you can see where the tension uh, comes up. So a 
strong evidential pluralism here would lead to at least confusion. Um, we would argue, if we accept evidential pluralism, that as long as we're not clear on which methodology is the right one, we should perhaps use all of these different evidential searches, but that leads to conflicting advice. Now, what then should we do? And perhaps it's tempting to give up on evidential pluralism for case study research and just say, listen, one view of causation, one methodology of finding causal evidence is correct overall. But that would ignore um, the argument for evidential pluralism in the first place, which is that there are so many counterexamples to all different views of causation. So I think that we should take that first argument seriously, and it's not the case that we can give up on evidential pluralism altogether. So what's the alternative? Well, perhaps we could say that case study research as a whole simply lends itself more to one particular approach to causation than another. So for example, you might argue correlational methods generally fail in within case uh, causal analysis. There's just too much, um, there are too many complications, too many differences between case studies that this makes it impossible. So let's avoid the probability view of causation altogether and accept all other views that don't have this problem of comparison. Unfortunately, I think that uh, as long as you accept that both uh, Derek and my position, both the systems view and the interventionist view are non-correlational, um, you would still run into the pluralist tension. And that's uh, evident from this example. So my final solution, which I uh, strongly advise uh, on, is that you should restrict evidential pluralism by choosing one approach in individual cases. So pluralism, but a pluralism case by case. Now, how would this work? Um, you need to consider the aim of the study to establish um, which of the evidential searches fits best. And I will show this for Tan and Walt in the next slide. And you delimit your situation and you say which monist view of causal evidence is applicable in this particular case. Out of all of the different evidential searches that you could do, which is the most appropriate? Um, this does not exclude, and I think that's a, an important thing to, to bring up here, this does not exclude that different case studies might have different approaches that are most suitable. So it is not the case that, for instance, the systems view doesn't work altogether. It is the case, however, that it works only for some case studies and not for others. And similarly for the interventionist view, it works for some case studies and not others. But if you try to use both at the same time, you will get at least very confused as a researcher. Right, so in the Thunderbolt case study, um, what is her aim and how does this fit with one of these evidential searches? Well, uh, Thunderbolt wishes to explain non-use. So this is an absence and I feel very strongly that counterfactuals would be more suited to um, a causal analysis of non-use than, say, a system to for instance. On the other hand, a lot of Tan and Walt's talk is aimed at working out what would have happened, for instance, if public opinion had been different during the Eisenhower era, what would have happened then um, in the Korean War? So again, this is quite well suited to this interventionist view because that also is based on counterfactuals. And then finally, uh, in her conclusion, Tana Wolf makes clear that she is interested much more broadly than in just the American case. She wishes to test a more general hypothesis. She wishes to know whether the nuclear taboo in general for states with nuclear power could be a stronger explanation of non-use than, say, deterrence. And so again, all of these different aims together fit quite well with what I've called the interventionist view. But this is one case study. And so it might be that for, different, for a different case study, another approach is more suitable. All right, so in conclusion, what does this uh, mean for evidential pluralism in philosophy of political science? I think that what we've seen here is that um, you need to, even within case study research, look at the aims of the study for choosing a methodology. And now typically this is discussed when we're talking about multi-method advice or multi-methodology advice, but it's applied at a much smaller scale. 
So we usually find this discussion about aims in this qualitative quantitative divide, um, for instance, when you read Sharon Krasno's 2011 paper, she suggested that one way of understanding this methodological pluralism is through recognizing a plurality of goals that various different methodologies seek to achieve, but she's talking at a much higher level about, say, qualitative versus quantitative, and I have shown here that this also works within case study research. So different aims lead to different methodologies. Now, what could we do to expand this uh, area of research, the philosophy of political science? One would be um, at a more abstract level to ask how the paradoxes, the limitations that led to evidential pluralism in the first case, say redundancy over determination, linked to concrete case study research questions and aims. So which paradoxes and which limitations um, limit which evidential searches we can do for a particular aim. And on the other hand, I'm very much interested in knowing whether this pluralist tension, as I've described here, is unique to the examples that I've given. So the example I've given is just case study research in political science, but perhaps this works more generally in case study research. It might work more generally in other social sciences, or it might even work beyond case study research. And so my intuition is that it does, based on the um, discussion that I've just highlighted in Krasno, for instance, but this is uh, something that I'm interested in in the future. Thank you. Okay, uh, questions? Uh, I guess, I guess, I, oh, right, sorry, uh, Graham. Uh, yeah, Graham. Hi, uh, thanks for that. So, I'm, I think I'm sympathetic to the, the thrust of your argument, and it sounds like we're pushing, like, if one wants to be a pluralist, one's pushing towards a kind of pragmatism where you're really considering what your interests are in investigating a particular thing and tailoring your, um, you know, tailing your approach to, to your particular sort of explanatory context. But one of the things that certainly Peirce has is the idea that if we're explaining a phenomenon out there in the world, it's a sign that it's a genuine phenomenon that we can identify it through a range of different methods. So he uses some astronomical examples where we can use two different methods to discover the same thing. So there's still gonna be a distinctive kind of advantage of, of a pluralist approach that different investigations rather than within an investigation different investigations can highlight the same kind of structures does that sound right well i, I want to push back against that a little bit in the sense that so you might assume that there is a truth of the matter out there about the korean war and non-use during the korean war However, it depends entirely on your aims with that research, which type of evidence is more suitable. And it's not the case that, say, a systems of analysis of this versus an interventionist analysis of this uh, would be false. That's not the case. But it is the case that one of these methods or methodologies, rather, will be more useful. And that is the pragmatic aspect of this. I'm not saying that one of these uh, views gets the world right. I'm saying that one of them is more suitable to the aims that we have under study. So triangulation here is a um, would be a way if all that we were interested in perhaps is to describe the narrative um, as fully as we possibly can. But that is not uh, almost never what we are trying to do here. So that's why I'm pushing back against that a little bit, even though I agree with the first part of what you said, that we are being pragmatic in this uh, analysis. Thank you. Sorry, can I just, because um, I, I wasn't sure I heard where the pushback was. So, uh, so triangulation you accept does allow us to more fully grasp the, the phenomena, but it's not clear that every case of triangulation is going to be worth doing just because we might already have solved the explanatory purpose that we, we went with. 
Yeah, that's one way of putting it. I, I mean, uh, of course, in the case of the natural sciences, this seems much more suitable, right? So this triangulation, whereas I think what I've shown is that in, say, an analysis of a social science case, a thick observation of causation perhaps might be a very different kind of um, evidential search than a thin observation of causation supplemented with, uh, for example, comparative analysis. And um, so that is perhaps where the extension uh, is most obvious. But I think eventually it is going to be the aims that matter in choosing this methodology. Thank you. Thank you. Chris. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so I really am really sympathetic towards a lot of your criticisms of the, um, the systems approach to mechanism. Um, but I wanted to ask you about uh, a worry I have about the sort of interventionist alternative. And I guess that worry is that, you know, in the social sciences, you know, there's so many constitutive relations between macro stuff and micro stuff. Mm -hmm. It's all very, it's all very messy. And if you take an interventionist approach, there has to be at least an in principle sense in which you could change just one tiny feature of the system and leave everything else the same. And there'd be a sensible kind of controversial question about what would have happened. Yeah. Um, and I worry a lot about that. And I, I wonder whether you share that worry or, or is there some reason maybe you don't worry about it so much? Sure, sure. So uh, one of the most complicated challenges in giving this interventionist view in social science and particularly in political science because that's the area that I'm most uh, into at the moment is that you can't describe a hypothetical intervention as clearly as Woodward for instance does in the natural sciences right so he has this great example about well what would have happened if the moon had been closer to the earth Great, you can do that. You can make a, a great hypothetical intervention out of that. But of course, when it comes to, say, changing Eisenhower's mind about nuclear weapons, that's much more difficult. Does that mean it's impossible? I don't think it is. It's not logically impossible. And that's one of these really quirky things that uh, Woodward is trying to do in this interventionist view, is he's trying to make a distinction between which interventions are logically possible and hypothetical, and which are logically impossible and hypothetical. And he tries to get rid of the latter. My fundamental intuition is that counterfactuals are going to play a role in all of these case study analyses. And I think that Tannenwald makes a very clear example of that because she actually does employ quite a few counterfactuals in her story. Now, how do we get evidence for those hypothetical interventions? And that is where I think your worry comes in. So perhaps it will be very difficult to get evidence for those hypothetical interventions, that is uh, somehow clinching the situation. But I don't think that that means that we should avoid it altogether. And I think that there are clear cases in the literature where you can see people use these counterfactuals and support them with decent pieces of evidence. Thank you. Robert. Uh, thanks, yes. Uh, hi, Reza. Um, I, um, I like the talk. I think I sympathize with most of what you say in it. I was just wondering to sort of widen it slightly if you saw there's a tension between the case study approaches you're looking at and the previous talk by Yafeng and John, in particular, it seems hard to imagine getting sort of appropriate correlational evidence in many of these case studies because they're so sui generis, the confluence of different factors. Um, so does that mean that contrary to um, the sort of Rousseau-Williamson thesis applied to social science, contrary to that, we don't necessarily need correlational evidence for causal inference, or mm. would you not want to commit to that? I would argue that the kind of evidence that we give for uh, whether it's correlations, oh sorry, whether it's counterfactuals or whether it is entities and activities might well look like correlations, right? So it might well be some kind of statistical analysis, but that's always going to be for one simple step in the mechanism. It's never going to be for the mechanism altogether. So that is, I think, where uh, you are right in that statistical analyses on a large scale for our mechanism as a whole might not make any sense. But statistical evidence for small steps of the mechanism might make more sense. Thank you. Derek. 
All right. Uh, just uh, actually, just a suggestion on on terminology. Um, I, I I completely kind of buy your argument, and but but I think there's the, maybe distinguishing between and you were using the thin thick, but here actually also mm -hmm. thin and thick mixed methods or mixed methodologies, right? Mm -hmm. So so the way I see a lot of the literature and also practice is that people do what could you call thin mixed methods or or mm -hmm. or or just mixed methods, you could call it, right? Where, for example, they do, they, their, their core causal claim is an RCT, maybe they're doing a survey experiment, but then to understand how respondents are going to, you know, understand their questions, then they do kind of a, you know, a, a, a very superficial interpretivist kind of focus group asking people how they understand questions, right? So you're, you're leveraging the, 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 the interpretive uh, focus group as a as another method, but but it's 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 just helping you design a better RCT, right? And that's the core kind of part. I think what you're arguing is is actually is for like almost like a mixed methodology, but then applied to case studies is is mm -hmm. is, is saying that that's impossible because then you're just doing such different also uh, ontological claims. Um, so it, so it's not mixed methods, it's mixed methodologies, I think. Um, okay. And that's the distinction. And then I think you're completely right then is, is, is saying, you know, the, and, and I think it would be really productive uh, to pull out more, like when would we choose? Because mm -hmm. I think that's like, what are the types of questions? This is particularly, you know, what, what am I interested in? What's the, it could be both, you know, the theoretical research questions. It could be also the evidential context. Mm -hmm. uh, how how mechanistically heterogeneous is the population? Because of course, counterfactuals have huge problems when we when we move into a very heterogeneous environment, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So I think pulling that out would be would be really fantastic and 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 a, yeah. and a real um, a real contribution. So sure. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, of course, it's always uh, interesting to provide a whole talk where you introduce someone else's view before they actually speak. So thanks for uh, <laughs> letting me off the hook there. So one of the things that, uh, one of the, the reasons why I call this thin and thick versus how the terms are used perhaps in the political science literature is simply from a uh, philosophy of causation point of view. So the whole Humean, uh, anti-Humean perspective. And I think that that's my, because it's my own background, that's uh, very natural, but I do agree that perhaps in a methodology journal that wouldn't be a suit. So yeah, I agree with you there. Thank you. Okay, uh, I guess maybe I have one quick final question if we have time. So um, I wanted to ask about kind of the nature of the pluralism you're talking about here, because so it's clear that you can have an interventionist account of, of mechanisms, whereby you say a mechanism is some system, composed of, of parts and interactions or whatever you want to say that we can intervene on. But I think you know, that, that should be differentiated from an interventionist account of causality. Right? Mm -hmm. So in the case that you might say a causal system, perhaps even a non-mechanistic system, um, can be intervened on in some way, so long as it's sort of stable, the generalizations it's made are stable under certain num a certain number of interventions, and then we can ascribe sort of causal relations or causal claims uh, to that to that system, right? And so you sort of make a distinction there between the interventionist account of causality and the interventionist mm -hmm. account of mechanism. And I didn't know in the background were you kind of assuming? So you spoke at one time of uh, your account of mechanism being in, an interventionist account of mechanism, and then mm -hmm. the, the systems account. Was there sort of an assumption there that you were dealing with sort of mechanism and causation at the same time? So one of the things that I think is very convincing about Woodward's later analysis of uh, manipulability is that he is talking about methodologies and he's not talking about an ontology of causation. And I take that on board wholesale. So this is not a way of talking about what causation really is or causality really is. This is a way of talking about what kinds of evidence can help us find causal relations. And I think whether you are talking about causal relations in a mechanism or whether you're talking about causal relations in a more simple um, cause and effect relationship doesn't matter. It is still interventions that are going to be helpful in finding uh, evidence for that causal claim. And of course, like I argued, there are going to be certain situations in which this methodology is more suitable, but I see it as a methodology and I don't commit to it as an ontological view. 
Okay, so the idea is, yeah, I think so. so. The idea is that sort of we can we can have evidence of mechanisms by means of sort of an interventionist approach or by means of a another kind of approach, whatever it might be. And then the question of causal or causal description comes later on. Yeah. So, so the pluralism, the, the plural tension that you're talking about is about how we have evidence of mechanisms. In the exactly. Yes, it's about these searches, practical searches uh, on the ground for researchers they are going to be conflicting, right? If they have to use both of these methodologies at once. But that's not to say that one methodology is more suitable about uh, a view of the world or a view of causation uh, wholesale. It's not necessarily an ontological commitment. It doesn't have to be. No, okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, I think we're, we're finished now. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And uh, now we have lunch. Um, until one o'clock, I think, was it one thirty? Oh, yeah, one thirty. Yeah. So this afternoon session will be in at one thirty. So enjoy your lunch, guys. See you Thank soon. You. Bye. So yeah. Um, I can climb the host, and uh, yes. so could you stop uh, recording, Sen? Oh, sorry. Yeah.